The other thing which is going on is, as you've seen before, China's oil, coal consumption. It's been increasing very rapidly over the last five or six years. Now, co China's coal consumption doesn't stay in China. When you buy a computer or any good from China, you're buying Chinese coal. Sorry, you're buying Australian coal, which is burnt in China. Okay, but you're using the energy from coal to um, to show your uh, your money to to embody your money um, in in products. Okay, so I think that um, the the time uh, of the last five years or so that GDP is allowed to rise has been caused by by China's ability to burn coal and um, and the world debt problem. But, of course, we're now running out of space in terms of debt. The, the financial system of the Western world is built upon debt. When you borrow money from a bank, you promise to pay back not only the capital, but interest. And the only way that can work is if you have a growing economy. If you have a growing economy, then it's very easy to pay back both the capital and the debt, and everyone's happy. And that's essentially the situation which has occurred for all the 20th century, but um, because oil is starting to run out now and energy is starting to run out now, GDP is starting to stagnate, and if it starts declining, then no one will be able to pay back their debt. Okay? Now, if you can't pay back your debt, that's pretty serious. That, that goes on to a, an economic collapse. So when the global wealth is decreasing, then the ability of countries to pay back money is very doubtful. So why do we need growth? The world e needs growth to keep people employed. The other thing which is happening as we go through time is things get more efficient. Technology comes along and makes factories and production more efficient, which also means that unless you've got growth, you can't keep people employed because the efficiency of machines and that takes over so people go out of work. If you've got a growing economy, there's no problem. You can keep people employed. And as I said, the financial system needs growth to pay back debt and for the interest payments. Now, I haven't mentioned the third world yet, because that's the real killer. If you want to get really depressed, um, think about the third world. Because the third world has to have growth to survive. Wages and incomes in a lot of developing countries are so low that if their income goes down, then they starve. Unless they can grow their economies, um, it's not going to work. So we have this problem. The world economic system needs growth, but continuous growth is physically impossible. This is a graph which came out of the oil drum um, quite recently. It was produced by a physicist, associate professor, um, Tom Murphy, in the US, and he looked at the absurdity of continuous growth. He chose uh, an energy increase per annum of 2.3% per annum. That's pretty modest um, compared to the world's overall energy consumption, which is increasing by about 3% per annum. And what he found was that in a little over 200 years, we would have to cover 20% of the world's land area with photovoltaic panels to provide that energy. OK, that's probably not doable, but it's, you, know, you could possibly think about it. In about 300 years, we would have to cover the whole of the world's land surface with solar panels. In 400 years, we would have to cover the entire Earth with solar panels to produce the amount of energy. OK, that's pretty, pretty far-fetched, isn't it? But in 1,400 years or so, which is you know, only back to the Dark Ages, the Earth would have to produce enough energy as is currently emitted by the entire sun. OK, this is getting a bit far-fetched. We can probably, probably draw the line here, but th this guy keeps going. This keep guy keeps going back to um, two millennia, 2,400 years, and if we kept increasing our energy supply at 2.4% per annum till then, we would have to use the energy of the whole galaxy. OK, we'll quit there. 
We won't go further than the galaxy. It's not going to happen. Murphy exclaims that this is madness, and of course it is. So we've got this fundamental dilemma. The world economic system can't work without growth, and we can't have growth forever. So what do we do? What are we going to give up? We either have to give up growth or the world economic system. Why, why, this is my question to people here, have we let the world get to the situation whereby the inertia of the global system, because we can't change from solar, from fossil fuels to, to solar and wind quickly, most people estimate that it's going to take at least 40 years to do this, in time to avert an energy decline and an environmental catastrophe, which is only 19 years away now, why have we let come to this point? Are we not more intelligent than bacteria? It's bacteria do this. They keep growing in a, in a test tube until they completely run out of food and energy. But, you know, you people here are all university students. I would have thought that you're probably a bit brighter than bacteria. Hands up. <laughs> It's even worse when you look back at people who've actually thought of this before. Hubbard, King Hubbard, the US geologist, who first pointed out peak oil back in the 1940s. I always like to show this slide because this, was, this paper was written in science before I was born. Okay, and he shows fossil fuels as a blip. And he realized that unless we move to renewable energy in a timely manner, and put in place energy conservation measures that the world population would have to decline. If we kept along scenario one here and kept at the peak, right, we're moving along here so we're using the same energies as we're using at the moment, then we can keep our population. The seven billion people which are on the earth at the moment will, will be in October. If we don't, then the world population has to decline. And if we really stuff up and our world energy goes back to pre-industrial levels, then it's highly likely that the world population will go back to pre-industrial levels, one or two billion. Have I depressed everyone? I should have. If you're not worried, you should be. Will Catton. Will Catton came here a few couple of years ago now. Um, Will Catton's famous because he wrote a book called Overshoot in 1982. The book Overshoot, essentially the essential thesis it was of it back in the 80s, was that humanity has overshot its carrying capacity. That we need more than one Earth now to keep everyone happy. Uh, Will has put out a new book called Bottleneck. And you can probably work through in your mind what that means. Okay? That... Humanity is going, has to go through a bottleneck and its population will decline. Will Catton, his grandson, is one of our PhD, well, sorry, he's not our PhD students. So I'm not sure if he's here. Um, he's just, just graduated from the university. So we have a connection with Will. Okay, so things look pretty gloomy. What are my answers? Well, I've sort of struggled with this, um, this problem over the last five or six years. And it seems to me my first solution was that it's a tragedy of the commons, where corporate interests take precedence over community interests. Because peak oil and climate change are taken as a threat to economic growth. And because economic growth is an axiom of our economic system and is defended with religious zeal. Look at the newspapers every day and all they talk about is growth. Look at what John Key says. Look at what the Labour Party says. They all talk about growth. And I've explored lots of different reasons for this insanity. I've even gone into psychology. I've looked at the evolutionary problem in our brain. Looked at Arthur Kussler, who thinks that um, our mind is seriously faulted. And I published a paper called The Growth Delusion. Just, just over the summer period, I came across a book called The Sane Society by Eric Fromm. Eric was a, a polymath. He was born in 1900 and died in 1980. And he argued in the mid-1950s that humanity as a whole, society, was in fact insane. <laughs> I 
The reasons he gave for this insanity were war. He looked up data, and from 1500 BC to 860 AD, there were 8,000 separate conflicts where humans attacked each other and killed each other. That works out to be around about 2.4 conflicts per annum. He also thought the economy was pretty hopeless. Wars contribute to GDP. Consumption and waste contributes to GDP. Growth is paramount. There's no emphasis on just being, on well-being, but just on having more stuff. He also was highly critical of the media and advertising as one reason why we're insane. He suggested that the population is filled with mindless trivia, the cheapest trash and sadistic fantasies. This was back in the 1950s. Hey, they didn't have media then. <laughs> they had no Facebook. <laughs> Since then, what's happened? I did a count. Wikipedia produces a, has a website, a website, a, a, an item, which looks at the number of conflicts. Now, since the World War II, there's been around about 200 um, conflicts in the world, which is around about 2.7 per annum. So it's slightly higher than the historical average, but maybe we've got better reporting then. The important thing is that the number killed, the number, the percentage killed of the population has been increasing. And we now have thermonuclear weapons. We've got drones, cluster bombs, and depleted uranium. The, our ability to wage warfare since, since the 1950s has increased dramatically. The economy, well, you know, that's completely out of control. Um, Europe's on life support. Uh, Greece just made a technical default just this week. The US is deadlocked, trying to raise its debt limit above 14.3 trillion. Media and advertising. The update is that, well, we've just heard of the Murdoch circus has hit town, and the culpability of the media in contributing to the insanity is finally being recognized. But we also now have neuromarketing targeted on children. We have 3D, exceedingly violent video games. We have mobile advertising and all the rest of the media paraphernalia that you see today. So I think the real question that we have to answer is are people actually capable of independent thought? We have university students here who are supposed to be taught to think independently, but how many of you can actually do that? Can you resist the media, neuromarketing, the global advertising machine, the war machine, the growth economy, and the mindless pursuit of more wealth and ever more stuff? And importantly, can the rich ever decide to reduce their consumption to allow the poor to increase theirs? Finally, does Bob have any hope left? Yes, the mere existence of this talk, initiated by Generation Z Zero, gives me hope. But it will be need to be transformed into a worldwide movement. So get moving, chickens. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>